Hi everyone, uh, we're going to read chapter 2, The Open Road of Wind in the Willows and uh, if you remember Moles moved in with Ratty and in this chapter we meet a character we've met before but we're going to find out a lot more about him. Can you guess which one? The Open Road. Ratty said Mole suddenly one bright summer morning, if you please I want to ask you a favour. The rat was sitting on the riverbank singing a little song. He'd just composed it himself so he was quite taken up with it and would not pay proper attention to Mole or anything else. Since early morning he'd been swimming in the river in the company of his friends the ducks and when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he would dive down and tickle their necks just under where their chins would be if ducks had chins till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at him for it's impossible to say quite all you feel when your head is under water. <clears throat> at least they implored him to at last they implored him to go away and tend to his own affairs and leave them to mind theirs. So the rat went away and sat on the river bank in the sun and made up a song about them which he called Ducks Ditty. All along the backwater through the rushes tall, ducks are a dabbling up tails all. Ducks tails, drakes tails, yellow feet a quiver, yellow bills all out of sight, busy in the river. Slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim, here we keep our larder, cool and full and dim. Every one for what he likes, we like to be, heads down, tails up, dabbling free. High in the blue above, swifts whirl and call, we are down a dabbling, up tails all. I don't know that I think very much of that little song rat, observed Mole cautiously. He was no poet himself and didn't care who knew it, and he had a candid nature. Nor don't the ducks neither, replied the rat cheerfully. They say, why can't fellows be allowed to do what they like, when they like, and as they like, instead of other fellows sitting on the banks and watching them all the time and making remarks and poetry and things about them? What nonsense it all is. That's what the ducks say. So it is, so it is, said the mole with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well then, it isn't, it isn't, replied the mole so soothingly. But what I wanted to ask you... Won't you take me to call on Mr Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make, it, make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Early or late, he's the same fellow. Always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole, as he got into the boat and took the skulls, while Rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat, so simple, so good-natured and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses, and it may be that he is both, both, both boastful and conceited, but he has got some great qualities, has Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick, with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said Rat, and that's the creek on the left, where the notice board says private, no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse, where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over to the right, that's the banqueting hall you're looking at now, very old that is. Toad is rather rich, you know. And this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit so much to Toad. They glided up the creek, and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats slung from the crossbeams or hauled up onto a slip, but none in the water, and the place had been un had unused and deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boasting is played out. Boating, rather, is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what his new fad he's taken up now. Come along, let's look him up. We shall hear all about it soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, and they presently happened upon resting in the wicker garden chair, with a preoccupied expression of his face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! he cried, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. 
I want you badly, both of you. Now what will it take? Now what will you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you turning up just now. Let's sit quiet a bit, Toad, he said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair, while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boastfully. Or anywhere else, for that matter, he could not help adding. Here the nut rat nudged Mole. Unfortunately, the Toad saw him do it and turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence. Then Toad burst out laughing. All right, Ratty, he said. It's only my way, you know. And it's not such a very bad house, isn't it? Is it? You know you rather like it yourself. Now look here. Let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the Rat, with an innocent air. You're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching you may... Oh, poo boating interrupted Toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that... I've given up... I've given that up long ago. <clears throat> Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows, who ought to know better spending all your energies in that aimless manner. Now I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it, and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in triviality. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if he will be so good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression, and there, drawn out the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried Toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's a real life for you embodied in that little cart the open road the dusty highways the heath the common the hedgerows the rolling downs camps villages towns cities here today up and off to somewhere else tomorrow travel change interest excitement the whole world before you and a horizon that's always changing and mind this is the finest cart of its sort that was ever built without any exception come inside and look at the arrangements planned them all myself i did the mole was tremendously interested and excited and followed him eagerly up the steps into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see, biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you can possibly want. Soda water here, backy there, letter, paper, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes, you'll find. He continued as they descended the steps again. You'll find nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat slowly, as he chewed a straw. But don't overhear you say something about we, and start, and this afternoon. Now, you dear go good old ratty, said Toad imploringly, don't begin talking that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you. So please consider it settled, and don't argue. It's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life, and just live in a hole in a bank, and I want you. To, I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. I don't care, said Rat doggedly. I'm not coming, and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river, and live in a hole, and boat, as I've always done. What's more, Mole's going to stick to me, and do as I do, aren't you, Mole? Uh, of course I am, said the Mole loyally. I'll always stick to you, Rat. And what you say is to be, and has got to be. All the same... It sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know, he added, wistfully. Poor Mole, the life adventurous was so so new a thing to him, and so thrilling, and this fresh aspect of it was so tempting, and he'd fallen in love at first sight with the canary-coloured cart and all its little fitments. 
The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointed people, and he was fond of them all, and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching both of them closely. Come along in and have some lunch, he said diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We needn't decide anything in a hurry, of course. I don't really care. I only want to give pleasure to you fellows. Live for others. That's my motto in life. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad Hall always was, the Toad simply let himself go. Disregarding the rap, rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. Naturally a voluble animal, and always mastered by his imagination, he painted the prospects of the trip and the joys of the open life and roadside in such glowing colours that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow it soon seemed taken for granted that all three of them, by all three of them, that this trip was a settled thing, and the rat, though still unconvinced in his mind, allowed his good nature to override his personal objections. He could not bear to disappoint his two friends, who were already deep in schemes and anticipations, planning out each day's separate occupation for several weeks ahead. Right, we'll leave it there. Um, so, we found out a little about Toad. He sounds a very excitable fellow. And I think we're going to find out an awful lot more about him over the next few chapters. Um, I hope you're all well and happy. And keep reading. I'll speak to you soon.